I ngā mana e ngā reo, e ngā kārangatanga maha o ngā hau e whā tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa. Ngā mihi ki ngā kaiwhakahaere me ngā kaimahi katoa ki te UN Sustainable Development Goals Summit. Um, tēnā koe Christy, tō tātou Tech Assistant mō tēnei hui. Uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou ngā tangata katoa mō tō koutou haere mō o koutou hō mai whakaaro e tēnei kaupapa me tō koutou mahi i ara i ara. Uh, he karakia whakatuwhera, tuku atu airua. Tuku atu airua ki a rere ki ngā taumata. Hai ara hi a tātou mahi me ngā tātou whai i ngā tikanga a rātou mā. Ki a mau, ki a ita, ki a kori ai ngaro, ki a pūpuri, ki a whakamaua, ki a teina. Haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. Well, kia ora koutou. Uh, welcome to this Zui space. Thank you all. Um, yeah, just shout out to the to the workers, to everybody behind this Un United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Summit, um, which has moved quite rapidly online, uh, making our workshop here today pants optional, if you like. But um, I've, I've got mine on because I wanted to sort of get in the mood although I am wearing my slippers, but I digress. Um, yes, it's it's really wonderful that you've come along today to hear about Te based climate assemblies for Aotearoa. My name is Callie O'Neill. I'll be um, a main facilitator today. Um, I My background is in participatory design uh, with a history in, in architectural trainings and an unfounded passion for the benefit of participation in all aspects of design, whether it's buildings or politics or families, it's um, it's better together. So I'm being supported by my fellow group members, um, Sharon Arthur, who's a finance manager by day. Sharon, as I introduce you, please wave wildly, thank you. <laughs> finance manager by day, deliberative democratic enthusiast by night. We have Rosalind McIntosh, who's a retired biomedical research professor with international experience in peacemaking and a passion about the power of listening to each other beyond the spoken word. We have Ruzbe Karimi, a civil engineer specializing in participatory processes. Now, Peter Glenzor, who's been involved in the community sector his whole adult life, as well as serving as a local and regional councillor um, for, for years and has been on the board of the DHB. And we have Elena Ashby, who's a project manager by day and community organizer and deliberative democratic enthusiast by night and has been heavily involved in movements that our society has uh, benefited from greatly. So that's us for today. And we, um, these, those people I've just introduced, they will be helping you in the breakout rooms when we get to that part. So over this session, we are gonna look at why we are undertaking this work um, what the pathway ahead is looking like, and we're really excited to hear from you um, on the most important aspect of this, which is what it truly means to embody Te Tiriti of Waitangi in this, in this work. So we'll start with a presentation of slides um, to give you an overview of what we mean when we say deliberative democracy and assemblies and Te Tiriti based climate assemblies, um, and we'll introduce our climate assembly in Porirua. Uh, we'll show you a short snippet of a video which has some participants and decision makers who have experienced deliberation responding to their experience. Um, and then we're going to have a quick Q&A after that. So over the slideshow and the video, if you've got questions, please put them into the chat. And Elena is going to be picking approximately five minutes worth of um, those questions out of the chat for us to answer after the presentation and the video. After that, I'll introduce the breakout, breakout room session and we're going to go into a very small sample of a part of a deliberation process using this issue that we believe is the most important to get right here in Aotearoa, which is um, embodying Te Tiriti. After that, we'll have a short report back from the groups and at that stage, we will be needing to say goodbye. So a short session today, but very pleased um, to have you with us. And without um, further ado, I am going to share my screen and take you through the slideshow that we have prepared. Okay, and I trust that you can all see that. Thank you. So our group, uh, Te Reo Nga Tangata, The People Speak, uh, formed in 2019 to pursue a Te Tiriti based climate assembly. 
Our work is developed through a shared passion for urgent climate action and a shared belief that deliberative democracy is what is needed to do this effectively. While we're focusing on climate, these methods can be used across all matter of civic issues um, and have proved particularly useful at addressing complex and intersectional issues that may have large trade-offs um, and opposing views. So in regards to the SDGs, we're specifically addressing goals 13, climate action, 16, peace and justice, strong institutions, and 17, partnerships to achieve the goal. However, as mentioned, I think we could include a lot, if not all of them, because these processes can be used to address all matters. So originally our group was open to national or regional opportunities to assemble, but we couldn't be happier to tell you that we are now working in collaboration with Ngāti Toa Rangatira, Mana Whenua of Porirua, um, towards holding a tetiriti based climate assembly in and for Porirua. For those who are unfamiliar, Porirua is about half an hour north of Wellington, Ngāti Toa Rangatira are the Mana Whenua, and it has the highest Pacific population um, outside of Auckland. So this assembly has the support of the Climate Change Commission and um, yeah, we are working in collaboration with many other allies. So why are we undertaking this work? Well, Te Reo Onga Tangata is acutely aware that not all voices are heard equally. It can be so easy to feel disillusioned and helpless when it comes to influencing government action on issues that are important to us. And even politicians are expressing their frustration. They can feel isolated and that they can't make a difference. On climate, glaciers are melting faster than we are making progress. And whether we are marginalized, disengaged, or very engaged in trying to make a difference, political effectiveness can feel unachievable. Winds are too slow, and in the case of Māori, often painfully taking generations, and then even then changes are too little too late. In fact, this exclusive system has always been designed to keep people out, and we will look at the birth of democracy briefly in a little bit. No doubt there'd be some agreement that there is plenty to complain about when it comes to the current political status quo and the need for the SDG goals are in fact evidence of that. Um, here are some examples of what we commonly hear, like it feels like our elected politicians can be bought by companies that don't have any morals towards the protection of people or the environment. You know, since its inception, the New Zealand government has failed to honour the country's founding document, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and this has had devastating effects for Māori and Māori culture. People don't feel represented and that therefore are inclined not to vote, which results in a feedback loop of less and less representation and a more and more exclusive political system. It can be said that New Zealand's wealth has come from the taking of resources and power off of Tangata Whenua Māori and putting it in colonial and tauiwi hands. Despite this founding document of our country, this abuse of power has carried on for the past 181 years and continues today. The, deter the deterioration of the quality of life and, and culture for Tangata Whenua has been overlooked, often in the interest of economic growth that benefits just a few alongside the control of resources and political power. But the strength of our society is reliant upon the well-being of all its people. And right now we clearly see that the wealth, poverty and access gaps are turning into chasms. Embodying Te Tiriti is the best guide we have. At its core, it is our agreement to act and no action should be taken without honoring its three articles. So this is why it is our central theme for climate assemblies. Whilst there is a great deal of global precedence to learn from, it's our intention that every aspect of the development in Aotearoa be co-designed with mana whenua, not uplifted and planted, but used to inform and strengthen our own circumstances. The potential to vastly improve the quality of life, not just for Māori, who are currently and have historically suffered the most from our systems, but for all people who enjoy and take pride in living in this land and who feel a connection with Aotearoa New Zealand. We need to facilitate spaces where people can feel proud of their culture. It could also be make this Aotearoa version of deliberative democracy a world first, being a bicultural treaty-based democratic partnership. So these um, logos are just a handful of the assemblies that are happening around the world. And you'll notice there that in fact, many groups of indigenous people have been early adopters of the process because they have found that it can create opportunities 
and has been a powerful tool for being able to stand alongside current political systems and to be heard with the strength of a unified voice. So what does an assembly process look like? This is going to be a, a pretty quick run through, but number one, there needs to be a political commitment. And this can range from an assembly having full power as in the recommendations it makes are final and go straight into law. But the more common approach is that recommendations made by this assembly are received by elected representatives and a public response is given. And the, that response is required to be completely transparent to tell the public exactly how they will deal with the assembly outcomes. So two, honouring te tiriti, an Aotearoa specific aspect, which means partnering with mana whenua. Maybe, you know, there's lots of options that could come out of this. Um, there could be two assemblies and a partnership assembly, similar to the scenarios described in Matiki Mai, the report on constitutional transformation. Uh, or it could be that during the co-design process, it's possible to enable te noranga te ratanga to be throughout without separate facilitation. And this is an aspect that we are um, heavily focused on at the moment, working with Ngāti Tōa Rangatira. A co-design process will ensure suitability for the issue that's going to be addressed. And as I mentioned, it's my firm belief that the more information you have from those who are affected by the outcome of the project, the more appropriate and usable that project and its outcomes will be. Oversight means fairness and transparency, which will engender trust and just processes that can be enduring. The question is central to deliberation. What assembly, what the assembly is talking about and the exact wording of this question is sometimes finalized and firmed up by the assembly itself. So the population, it's really important that there is a large awareness um, and an enthusiasm held by the general public and the people in the community so that there is enough people for the selection process to be representative. Um, selection is most commonly done by a process called random stratified sortition, which means randomly selecting a very large pool of people and inviting them into the process. Of those who accept the pool, who, who accept the invitation, the pool is then narrowed down based on important demographics that are determined in co-design, such as income, gender, ethnicity, attitudinal positions towards the central issue and, and other things, um, including, of course, te tiriti and indigenous rights. Experts and stakeholders. Uh, the assembly is addressed by relevant experts. Um, an example of this is, is that the Climate Change Commission have offered their expertise to our assembly, but it's important to have a multicultural understanding of what constitutes an expert or a stakeholder and this is also going to be determined in your co-design process. And of course, an assembly is premised on every person being an expert in their own lives. So meanwhile, the wider community is involved through online, um, through online media and other engagements and information that is given to the assembly is made available to the general public. Nine, facilitation, a very important part of the process um, in order to ensure there is a safe space where these discussions can be had, where group cohesion and spaces to listen to different perspectives are not just reached, but authentically understood and can be touched by one's own experience. 10, reports. So the assembly will come up with a recommendation and these are often given to elected officials in the form of a report. Where possible, uh, the consensus is, an I is ideal um, but if necessary, a majority of vote is established and that happens at the beginning of the process by the assembly itself. Uh, 11, so follow through is essential. We need action after these assemblies uh, to ensure that the recommendations are acted upon. And I'd just like to emphasize again that this is a simplified look and all aspects of an assembly will be determined in a co-design process with mana whenua and local representatives. So what are, what are legislators, decision makers, people with power saying about these processes? You will hear very briefly in a video that will share what governments and councils who've been working like this are saying about these processes. But in short, greater cooperation by them and greater participation by the public in democratic process is able to make them more effective. Individual politicians don't have to be the face of difficult issues, which often brands them for life and can threaten their re-election. 
They feel more able to make decisions that people want with less backlash because they are better able to understand the wishes of their electorate. So these processes are improving the lives and jobs and probably the lives and fam of the families of elected representatives by making decisions that are more enduring, trusted and able to be enacted faster. For example, in Ireland on the divisive issue of abortion, the Eighth Amendment, it took only two and a half years to hold an assembly, receive its recommendations, hold a public referendum and then pass it into law, which is a phenomenal time frame compared to conventional political process. There are so many examples and we'll put a few of these in the chat um, towards the end of this session. So what are the people saying about this process? Overall, the people are amazed and they say that they feel valued, that they learn a lot, that the assembly adds quality to their lives, that they were supported to understand complex information they didn't think they would ever know, um, and that they feel trusted to make the best decisions that they can in the interest of their communities, which results in them feeling pride and also trusting the outcomes. So I said I'd talk a little bit about democracy. Why do we need to change our democracy? Well, a very short history, I would suggest that deliberation in its most inspiring form has been used by indigenous decision makers since time immemorial. And some of their techniques are directly influencing the ways we are using and creating methods of del deliberation today. The deliberation was also used in what we consider to be the start of democracy as we know it in ancient Greece. Um, but as I mentioned before, this democracy has always been exclusive. And there are some aspects of those processes that we would find very questionable today. Like for example, if you didn't own land or weren't of a particular class, you couldn't vote. If you were a female of any class, you couldn't vote. And slavery was just fine, but slaves also couldn't vote. So nothing is static, but now more than ever, we need change before that change is beyond our control. And this is our central issue. Government and business as usual have failed to take the action required to safeguard living conditions for the future of young people alive today and that of future generations. In fact, we see purposeful obscuring of climate change to maintain vested interests. I don't think I need to tell you that the science predicts things will get really bad if we don't make a dramatic turn. We are living in an increasingly dystopian world, lurching from one emergency situation to the next, and we have to talk about that. We have to find ways to, to together navigate our way back to safety, to transform these institutions in order that they and we and businesses and everyone can act. As Albert Einstein famously said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And with the sixth mass extinction beginning and ecosystems collapsing, it has become our responsibility to envisage and then realize methods of governance and decision-making that promote equity, well-being, education, and the natural environment upon which we all depend. We have to have hard conversations in safe ways. We need new ways to solve complex issues and we need to be holistic. And this is exactly what deliberative democracy can allow us to do. So here's where we are at with this vision. In the two years of working together, every politician we have spoken to has said they think it sounds fantastic, but no one has specifically offered to pick up the mantle. The Climate Change Commission is in full support and it is also written into their report that new ways of engaging with the public are essential for effective climate action. So they've offered their expertise, as I mentioned, to help our assembly comprehend the problem and the detail of their report. We have connected with multiple community organizations and networks in Porirua, including youth and marginalized communities. But most importantly, we have found true allies in Te Runanga o Tō Rangatira, Ngāti Tō Rangatira, the mana whenua of Porirua. And together we have begun a journey to a safer, more inclusive, fairer, and radically more effective way of working. With our assembly in Porirua, this could be not just an Aotearoa first, but a world first. And we are hoping to inspire and inform we're hoping that this can be replicable throughout Aotearoa and that we can start a process of learning and developing new ways of decision-making. 
So we have some independent researchers documenting our process and that's our intention to open source everything and all the information that we can because the only thing that can be competitive about achieving the SDG goals is how we get there fastest. So that's our slideshow. And before I stop sharing my screen, I'm just going to uh, show you this um, quick video. It can be a little bit unnerving, but I guess I was hopeful that we were going to be able to collaborate well together. It was like every question that we asked got answered. We got access to everybody. Uh, there was nothing that was off limits, there was nothing that we were told, no, you can't touch it, no, computer says no, or any, anything like that. I, I did think that maybe it might be a little superficial, um, but it soon, it soon occurred to me that, no, this is, um, you know, quite a serious project. I think certainly anyone who was tentative at the beginning of the process about the value of this type of engagement, they would have changed their mind by the end of the process and I really think understood that it's not scary. It's we know what the community uh, wants after they've had the information that we have to help make decisions. Now, if that results in us all understanding each other, uh, then that's, that's a greater level of control for an organisation to have and I think it, it's particularly important for public sector agencies who don't work in a competitive, traditional competitive commercial marketplace. Uh, we might have allowed for more people to be involved and not limited ourselves in some of the ways that we did, um, not having known that that depth of feeling and uh, enthusiasm for this type of process existed in our community. To get regular people giving non-conflicted advice after having a deep dive um, was so refreshing that I'm actually now a complete convert to this model and, and even think we need to go so far as to have a permanent standing citizens assembly sitting above the upper house in every Australian state and territory and in the federal parliament. Kia thank you very much for um, waiting, listening to all that. And just to emphasise again, that is an Australia um, example, but it is quite Eurocentric. So this is our focus on, on Te Tiriti. And thank you for um, your comments in the chat. I'll pass over to Elena, who may hopefully has chosen a couple for us to answer. Hey, hey, uh, Kelly, thank you. Um, Kia ora, awesome presentation. Um, I can see, yes, can, you... can see the video, can't see the video. Oops. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, there's a few tricky things with regards to videos and Zoom, but um, we will provide the link. So sorry about that technical glitch. Um, you, could, uh, you could hear that the politicians were saying um, that they completely underestimated the impact. And if they had their time again, they would actually do more of citizens assembly work. Um, the only other thing I'll say there is that um, they actually use citizens assemblies to look at their 10 year budgets and plans at a local um, state council level. So that's that's pretty um, amazing um, endorsement there. Does anyone have any questions? Um, there are no questions that I can see put into the chat. Um, plenty of engagement with people enjoying the presentation. Anyone have any questions? Please feel free to write them into the chat now or potentially even, I don't know whether people can unmute and ask a question, but. Um... Oh, the other option is we could play the video again. If everybody heard the words, it's probably, yeah, not, not necessary. I think I know I would have had to stop sharing and then reshare the other screen. Okay. If there's no um, questions at this point, that's, that's no problem. We can go into um, the deliberation session. Absolutely, and at this time at the end, you could always replay the video at this spare time. Yeah, or I, I totally, I highly recommend that you um, copy the links that Sharon will put in the chat towards the end, and um, there's some really interesting stuff there, including a, a 15 minute, absolutely mind blowing short documentary about the um, Irish process on their abortion law reform. Um, okay, so in, the, uh, in our breakout rooms, um, what we are going to do is split into five rooms 
Um, because of um, the numbers, we have um, we, what we're going to do is the facilitators will not quite randomly, but will um, select five people from the list to be participants. And then if you are not a participant, you are an important observer of what the participants are going to deliberate on. So each participant is going to get two minutes to speak anything that they would like to say about this question. The question is, what could equitable Tetariti partnership look like? So we really want to emphasize that this is about diversity of opinion. There is no right answer. There is no wrong answer. The quality is from the difference in views and hearing other people's perspectives is very helpful in shaping our own views. So the participants will have two rounds. The first round, we're asking you your thoughts on what equitable treaty partnership could look like. In the second round, we would like you to explain something that really resonated with you that someone else said and something that you would like to know more about or you were surprised by or you would need more information to understand that perspective. So the facilitators will go over this with you again um, when we get into the breakout rooms. Um, but yeah, so that's two rounds each of two minutes per person. And um, we are gonna ask one observer from each of these breakout rooms to just observe and to, to, to report back to this main group at the end of it with something that you found interesting, anything that you observed while you were watching these participants. Um, kia ora. Wonderful, thanks so much. So we're gonna hear from Elena and her group um, first and same, same rule applies, two minutes each, but if you don't need the full two minutes, then that's absolutely fine. Um, and I'll give you a 30 second warning. Kia ora, Elena. Kia ora, Kelly. This is on behalf of Nick Reed, Breeze Robertson and Diane Shand. Um, Diana Shand, they were okay with me saying their names. And um, so we had a really cool discussion. Um, from Breeze, love the idea of complex information being spoken, you know, being delivered and shared with ordinary citizens, having someone to explain it and in a room and together rather than written submissions or anything else. Um, uh, with Breeze coming from Australia, she could relate to Indigenous peoples not having a voice or being invited too late. So she definitely reflected on Tetriti in terms of um, not knowing how the detail of Tetriti would be reflected in an assembly, but always, always, always definitely having participation, co design co-led, um, not having one seat at the table or being invited too late, um, and asking mana whenua how they would want to be represented in an assembly. Um, Nick, for a lot of people, um, he thinks this would be a wonderful approach. Um, uh, he thinks that um, a lot, for a lot of his peers, and particularly young people, don't know how to be effective. Um, to translate their passion and ideas and action on climate into the wider um, community. You can write submissions or talk to local government, but that's very, very difficult. It seems the systems are set up to block people, um, whereas an assembly would be a way in. That kept coming up over and over. As to whether mana whenua could be 50-50 or more or less, um, or how to honour to Tiriti, he believes it's definitely some complex questions, but definitely should be led by mana whenua. Um, if we're truly going to imagine decolonization. Um, the resonating um, and reflection, people um, reflected actually how the process we used in the breakout room was like a deliberative process. So that was awesome. Um, Breeze described it as empowering, um, having that uninterrupted time, the ability to be listened and reflect and deliberate was great. Um, and uh, also reflected um, that if you don't know how to use your passion and not being effective as an individual, you can just give up. And whereas an assembly was more like an uplifting, connecting people together using the power of the group um, and being able to direct people's passion about climate um, and about to treat and together and forward. Ding, 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 ding. Sorry, I forgot to be timekeeper, but you're just <laughs> And can I just say one last thing from Diane pointed out how um, her experience of um, using these processes on the marae and about how Indigenous peoples have been using these processes for a run a day. Thank you. Kia ora, Elena. Kia ora, Mihi. 
And thank you. We Elena's got another important thing she's got to do, so we are losing her now, but we'll see you again. <laughs> um, Kua Tena, who we would like to go now. I was in Rosalind's group with Catherine Pete, and it was lovely to meet both of you. Um, we didn't really have a discussion, we just had a, an agreement where we all <laughs> all ranted on our, about the same thing, so it wasn't really deliberative. Um, uh, things that we came up with, language. Language is important, especially when it comes to te tiriti. We all agreed that equality was probably not the term we needed to discuss, rather equity. Um, uh, we also talked about the five principles that are behind the Tiriti, not the three that the three articles that are there. One of which is about spirituality, uh, peacefulness, and inclusivity, which I think um, we all would hope to have. Um, and that led us on to, um, uh, uh, in Catherine's words, honourable kawanatanga, well, that is te Tiriti based rather than the treaty based. Um, uh, and that would be uh, tiriti based kawanatanga that is um, for all of the people of Aotearoa and that would be something that then we can all buy into instead of people thinking it's a, a Māori Pākehā co-design or bicultural setup. So we wanted to sort of make sure that that was for all peoples rather than a bicultural approach. Um, uh, we all agreed also that um, development of relationships with iwi and Māori is a long burn and resources and capacity building are required within iwi, as well as people working with iwi to um, make the most of that kind of development and participation. Um, and one of the things I thought was uh, letting iwi develop their own approaches in a Māori design before they come and buy into co-design. All right, Catherine. <laughs> Got him. Yeah, thanks, Nilay. That's fantastic. It's uh, one we think. Some... Of, I don't think it was an, an either or. It wasn't no. In, I mean, the, the, the involvement with Tangata Penua was really important. So it wasn't just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I am going to have to keep people to time just because um, the UN, this, the organisers are wanting for people to have a break before um, well-being breaks. So uh, Peter's group, someone from Peter's group, please. I'm going to speak for this group. Um, so my observations are more about the logistics and the process of what we just did. Um, there's three people in our group um, with and and Peter, but two of us were not too familiar with the treaty itself. So the question was quite hard for us to answer. Um, so I guess that does point to like maybe a lack of knowledge for people emigrating to New Zealand. So I come from England a couple of years ago and I've never really been taught or understood the detail behind it so um but in terms of the actual process of what we did it was a short amount of time but I feel like I did gain a fair bit of knowledge from it and I found it really collaborative and I think as each person spoke and we went around the group and then each person spoke again every it brought out more in everyone and everyone had more to add each time so it worked really well in terms of people would listen to the next person and like use that to form a bit of a view and then discuss the next point. So it ended up being really collaborative on our side. That was really good. Kia ora. that sounds really, really nice. Great thoughts. So I think we've got two groups left, don't we? We've got Sharon's group and then Rosbe. So Sharon's group. Uh, rookie Era along with Lena, we were talking about who would um, feedback when we um, popped out of the breakout room. So I'm going to look at the two people remaining from my group and see if anybody wants to put their hand up. And if not, I will feed back. Nobody's diving in. Right, we had three people in our group and it was quite a diverse group. Um, and there was a real focus on the importance of demonstrating partnership by having partners in the room. Um, and also a question about um, how the assembly would actually look uh, in, in progress, how it would be um, limited, would it be geographic, would it be a different kind of a thing, um, but also highlighting the importance of building relationships and the importance of 
um, education. Kia ora. Kua mutu. Is that, that you're finished reporting back there? That yep. was a good, good, eff efficient one. Yep, sorry about that. Very efficient. Right, that's We've got great. five minutes. <laughs> Efficiency is, is fine by us. Um, and Rusbe and um, I was in this group as well. So we have Pauline who has offered to report back for us. Kia ora, Pauline. Yeah, um, we, we had a discussion about some of the different models we'd seen where um, Betty, people had tried to put the principles of Tadriti Waitangi into practice. Um, and both Jill and I, who was also Jill Gibbs in the group, would like to know more about the Pori Rua experience because it was the first time we'd heard of it. Um, because I think it's a real grassroots um, example. Uh, the the thing that we we also talked but but we talked about these these um, models or these these ways of operating in, in in line with the treaty are not static conversations are ongoing and evolving and I have seen in cases where uh, people have set things up um, along the lines of a treaty based treaty based and it sort of got stuck in time. And that, you know, that, that that might have been okay at that time, but you need to actually have the discussion is ongoing and evolving. Otherwise, it becomes a bit irrelevant. So that, that, was, that was one of the things we observed. I mean, the other thing is that, and there was a couple of people on the Zoom that I recognise, who've been involved in these issues for some time from a party perspective. Um, and we have, you, there is a growing awareness or at least a less um, resistance from Pākehā to um, things Māori. Um, but just how deep does that go? Because ding, ding, ding. One, of the things, one of the things is that when you're talking about the models you're talking about in Pororo, it's actually challenging some of the fundamental structures. And I think that's the challenge for the country in the future. What a, what a fantastic sentence to um, finish on. I think that's exactly what we are doing and, and what we need to do. Um, just before we close, um, I just want to yeah extend my great thanks and gratitude for you all coming along today. I know I personally learned a lot in, in the breakout group and I hope you've all been able to take something away. Um, if I can, please draw your attention to the chat. Sharon has been putting some um, links in there. If you would like to contact us and to learn more, we'd absolutely love to talk to you. Um, so our email address is in there, www. Oh, I mean, that's not what email addresses sound like. What is it? The people speak, aotearoa at gmail.com. Um, and then there's our other contacts. And she's also put in some links to um, clips, including the ones, the full version of the one that I um failed to effectively share at the beginning and um, a few other ones. So, and then there's resources, there's the Matiki Mai report, which is relevant to what we're talking about. Um, a, a global, um, Participedia is a global um, collection of all things deliberative that are happening at the moment. And there's also an OECD report of over 300 assemblies that have taken place and um, the results of those assemblies all incredibly um, positive, not because they cherry picked it, but because these are processes that we're seeing working um, really incredibly around the world. Uh, so yes, I just again would like to express my thanks to you all. I hope you've had a great online summit and um, we'll and, yeah, go, go well. I just, um, We'll end with a, a karakia whakamutunga to finish our session. And um, I'd like to just say the one that I shared at the beginning was about um, letting our spirits fly to greater heights and for our work to be guided by the successes of those who have come before us and the paths that they have built um, for us to walk upon and for us to build upon and um, that we need to hold on to that strongly and to never let it go. Um, and this... Next karakia is um, from, from uh, Peter from our group, just taught me this one recently, so I'm going to have to read it, and I thought it was a beautiful one to share this time, and it says that we have come to an awareness of the challenges that lie before us, 
Let us work together as one, stay well, so that we can have the ability to manage success. And behold, there is a pathway to enlightenment and well-being. What a positive feeling, Māori ora. So without um, yeah, further ado, ngā mihi nui, kia koe Christi, um, kia koutou mō tō haere i te hui a te ahi ahi nei, uh, he karakia whakamutinga. Kui hikitia te kaupapa, kua tākoto te wero, me huetahi i runga i te whakaro kotahi, te aki tō tāua o ranga, kia kaha ai mō te tuku taonga, kia tūtuki ngā hia hia mō kā hikitia, ti hei Māori ora, ki te whai ao, ki te whai o ranga e Māori ora. Nā koutou.